So we'll go ahead and get started. It's my goal to educate and entertain all of you this evening. And uh, the goal of this uh, hour or so experience, maybe a few minutes uh, uh, more than that, is to look at some of the classic sources of what it means to make a minion, look at some of how our ancestors viewed the significance and importance of minion, and how their understanding of what constitutes a minion can help inform our decision of what it means to make a minion today. So um, much of this is meant to, uh, some of this is meant to be interactive. Some of this is meant to be a little bit more frontal and hopefully I'll be clear as to which section is which so we're not staring awkwardly at each other while I'm trying to, to get feedback from different things. I uh, made a PowerPoint slide because when you make a PowerPoint slide, it makes it look like you prepared. And in fact, I did prepare. So uh, you should be able to see my screen over here. Give me a thumbs up if you can see my screen. And I want to remind everyone, I think that while you're looking at my screen, if you would like, I think there's a way you can click a button so you can actually see other people while, while my slideshow is up. Uh, and that way, in case you don't want to see my slides, you can look at something else. I think you should be able to do that. Uh, and if you can't, well, you can look at my slideshow. Okay, we'll rewind a little bit. Here we go. Who's excited? Give me a thumbs up if you're excited. No one. Oh, okay, now, if, so I'm learning there's a little bit of a delay, so I, so I shouldn't panic if it takes a few seconds for people to give me a thumbs up. Okay, let me make this bigger so I can see more of you. Okay. So it goes like this. Uh, tonight's class is entitled Wired to the Kadosh Baruch Hu, Minion via the Internet. And I took this title from uh, Rabbi... Uh, Reisner, who he wrote the, his achuva responsa on this, and you'll see it. We'll look at it in just a moment. Okay, so my first question, and this part is meant to be interactive, is why do we gather for minion in the first place? And this is a deeply personal question because, as the classic joke goes, right, Murray goes to Shul so he can talk to God, and Irving goes to Shul so he can talk to Murray right? People have different motivations for why they go to shul. And so what I'd like for all of you to do um, is if you want to share what is it about minion that you find interesting, attractive, meaningful, and if we can answer these questions, not with some people do it because of whatever, but rather this is why I like to go to minion when I go. So if you can show me, uh, if you want to contribute something, feel free to raise your hand. You can unmute yourself, and then you can say why it is that you like going uh, to Minion. Uh, Maxine W. Yeah, I like it because it gives me a sense of community. And I don't know, I, I just, it's something, it's also less uh, busy than, than being at home and being on the computer. You know, there's, there's a focus rather than, you know, the 16 things that are off to the side here that, that I'm not working on. So I'm going to thank you for being the Nachshona, so to speak, and being the first to dive into this conversation. Uh, there's something about going to Minion that makes you feel like you're part of the greater community. It allows you to focus, uh, be perhaps a little bit more present. There's something about that experience that perhaps is grounding, if I could put words uh, in your mouth. Other yes. people, other people. Susie, go for it. So as many of you know, shul going is not what I enjoy. I mm -hmm. always said I can daven at home. I don't have to use the seat door. I don't have to say the same words every day. Being home for the last two months, I cannot wait to get back to shul and be with people and actually daven as part of a community as opposed to being home alone. So I'm I looking forward to going back. So um, I'm going to take what you said. You like being with people? Right? There's like that aspect that even if you're praying by yourself, and in fact, during the Amidah, we're by ourselves and focusing inward, you're still part of a, a greater community and part of uh, you're surrounded by other people. Excellent. Uh, other answers? Other people who want to contribute? Uh, Richard Middleman. Okay. For two, um, at least two reasons. Number one, and not necessarily more important than the other one, it's important to go to show for other people who may have a yurt site who may have caught us. So number one, I'm going for somebody else. Number two, there is a certain peace that I get. Minion, I sit and pray. I don't always follow every single prayer the other people are doing. Sometimes I read it in English, sometimes I skip to something, 
but I've learned something and I enjoy it. So it's peaceful to me. Those reasons, I enjoy going to shul. Not necessarily for the 10, but just going to services. Excellent, excellent. Susie, you're gonna add one more thing. Thank you, Richard. Okay. Yeah, I mean, Richard touched upon it. Being in shul means that you're there for someone who is saying Kaddish. You can be someone that they can lean on for you and you can lean on them. So I think it's important just to have a minion. So you're saying Kaddish and it's not only you saying Kaddish, but other people are saying it with you. Other people might have known the person that you're saying Kaddish for and you can share memories. So it brings everybody closer. I'm taking notes of all these things. Excellent. Other Thank folks, you. we'll take a few more answers. Bill, take it away. Because there's more merit in praying with a minion. Uh, in other words, so, I mean, that's, that's the, ex expand our, on our tradition values, our tradition values davening with a minion. Our, our tradition puts a, a premium on, on that. Um, it's, it's better to pray with a minion than it is not to pray with a minion. And that's one reason why I go because, um, so there. It's a communal value and not just like, so if I can take what you're saying or tweak it a bit, it's not just, it feels good. We're offering support to each other, but the tradition itself says that the, if I can uh, suggest the efficacy, the value, the experience is actually better than when you just pray by yourself. There's something qualitatively different um, about praying together than praying as individuals. Do you agree? Yes, but I don't think that it's, yes. I'll, yeah, I'll agree. All right, circle More gets the square. Less. Diane, take it away. Uh, just a quick comment. We're commanded or we're advised not to separate ourselves from the community. And I think that um, there's uh, uh, both a negative and a positive side, but the positive far outweighs the negative uh, of being part of a community um, uh, throughout your lifetime. And also um, that supporting Jewish communal institutions is important. On Shabbat morning, we say Yakum Purkan for people who provide, if you've ever, anybody's ever read the English, it says people who provide the, uh, the oil for the candles and the salary for the people and the whatever and the whatever. So we are all advised encouraged uh, to be part of a community and to support that community. And I think that's part of what Bill was talking about as well, in terms of being a, a support for the community by being present at Dominion. Excellent. And that's one of those things that is a manifestation of being part of the community, right? If you go to Minion, that's one of those places where the community gathers and does something together. Excellent. We'll take one more comment. Anyone want to raise their hand? Anything else you want to add? Anyone? Naomi, you'll get the final word in this round. Go ahead. Well, if it's literally just a minion, then you know that you count, that each person counts and counts equally, and that's a really good feeling. So one of the interesting things about this is that uh, it doesn't matter if you're the shliach tzibor, it doesn't matter if you're the most learned person or someone who is just uh, delving a little deeper in Judaism. When you need 10 people, if you're looking for 10 Jewish people, it doesn't matter, everyone counts equally. And so in that context, everyone can contribute in the same way towards that communal enterprise. Beautiful. All right, so let's take, these are all our sort of, um, our experience uh, of going to Minyan. And I wanna juxtapose that, compare it to what our ancestors say about what actually is a minion and where a minion comes from. First thing I'd like to look at is actually like, where do we even get this notion that you need 10 people for a minion? Um, and it's kind of a, uh, well, you'll see, right? So where do we get this number from a minion? The first piece comes from the story of the 12 spies, 
The 12 spies are supposed to enter the land of Israel, do a report of what it looks like, check out the shuk, see how the train system is doing, and then they're supposed to come back and report so that the uh, Israelites or the Hebrews can then enter the land of Israel. And when they come back, uh, 12 of the, of the 12 spies, 10 of them give a negative report, and two of them give a positive report, right? And so in one of the psukim in Numbers, God says, Ad matai la hara'a hazot. He says, how much longer shall this wicked community keep muttering against me? And, he, and so the term they use is an eda, right? A community. And so what do the rabbis do? They look at another place. This is where the story of Korach and the rebellion, where God is going to schmice all of the Korach supporters. God says, Hibadlu mitoch ha'eda hazot ve'achale otam keraga. Stand back from the midst of this community. There you see that same word, Ada, right? That I may schmice them. And, you know, the hole swallows them up and all of that. But next to that word is this word, mitoch, right? Mitoch means amidst, uh, amongst, uh, mixed up with. And so if you connect it to a third verse, right, where God says, right, velo tachlalu et shem kochi venikdashti betoch b'nei Yisrael. You shall not profane my holy name, that I may be sanctified in the midst of the Israelite people. Right? So when it comes, I am the Lord who sanctify you. And so the rabbis compare, they say, look, here in this verse, when they use the word Eida, it means 10. And here is another verse where they say, here is an Eida, and the word mitoch ha Eida. And so here in this verse where it mentions the word betoch, it must mean 10. And so anytime you want to sanctify or you want to recite special text where you sanctify God's name, it means you have to do so with 10 people. And so this is the origin of having 10 people count in a minion. And in fact, in other places in rabbinic literature, we see that it's not always 10. In some communities, they use seven. Uh, and in some communities, we'll take a look, it's nine plus or plus a little bit. Now, so it's 10 Jewish individuals that have to compromise or com make a minion. Um, now, if any of you have comments, just dump them in the chat box. That's probably the easiest way. Uh, and, but we know that's not always the case. And so what I want us to do is take a look at the Shulchan Aruch. Sorry, uh, we'll go to Mishnah Megillah, which says, the, the Mishnah is a code of rabbinic text codified around the year 220 and serves as the basis of rabbinic literature. And they list all of these things that for which you need a minion, right? Ain porcina tashma, they don't recite the shma, and there's a lot of debate as to what that means, unless you have 10. The ain ovrin lifne hateva, they don't do a repetition of the amida. The ain nosein et kapehem, and they don't uh, lift up their hands, which is birkat koanim. The ain korin batora, and they don't do public Torah reading. The ain maftirin banavi, and they don't do a haftara. Right, ve'ain osin ma'amad umoshav, and they don't do the stops that you would do at a funeral. Ve'ain omrim birkat avelim. There actually used to be a blessing that people would offer uh, to mourners, um, and the blessing, in case you're curious, I went to look it up because I had never heard of it before, uh, and I looked it up. And in case you're curious, God says uh, you would say to people, ba'al nechamot yinachem etchem baruch menachem avelim. You would go up to someone and say, my brother or our brothers, may the master of solace comfort you. Blessed are you who comforts the mourners. It's a practice we don't have anymore, but still think it's kind of a neat, a neat bracha, right? Uh, and they don't mention God's name, God's name in the invitation of Birkat Hamazon, right? Pachot me'asara, unless you have 10 people, right? So 10 has become the number that we use. Let me look at the chat box. Naomi Lipsky mentions, uh, I always learned that it was Avraham bargained for Sodom and he went to 10. We will find as we look through rabbinic literature, sometimes if you have one good reason to explain something, sometimes it's better to have 10 good reasons to explain something. And sometimes the more good reasons you have, it makes you think that maybe we don't know exactly why we do something and the more, uh, and so that we need a lot of explanations for it. So based on everything we've said so far, number one, even from the time of the Mishnah, there was an awareness that uh, prayer in a group is different than prayer by yourself, 
and they list the things that you can do and the things um, that you can't do. Okay, you'll notice one thing missing from here. It doesn't say uh, Mourner's Kaddish in this list. Just one thing to be mindful of. Okay, so now the question is, what does it mean to be together? And before we look at the classic texts, uh, I'll ask a, a generic question. What does it mean to be amidst other people? What are some of the values, some of the criteria, some of the, 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 the requirements? How would you define as being amidst someone or amongst someone? Friends, I assure you, there's no right, well, you'll see. All right, what does it mean to be around somebody? Bob, take it away. So, I mean, up until now, I think most people would agree that they ought to be in the same room. That's in the midst. Um, of course, you go back a while, and as long as it was in the midst of 10 men, that, which would be different now, that it's egalitarian where we hang out when we get back there. Um, and certainly, you know, there's a, I'm in the midst of 29 dialing people right here. But in, in the past, it's always been physically in the midst. I think, so I want to get, get very specific. Does that mean that you're in the same room? Before this, yes. Okay. Before I ever thought that, oh, well, why don't we have a Skype or a, some video conference and pray together. And now I feel that we're in the midst. We all came, we would all come for the same reason. That's what makes us in the midst. So the intent of the people there, that's part of it. Right. Excellent. Okay. And I saw that I think uh, Diane Newman said something very similar in her, uh, in the chat box. Um, I want to just mention if I know there's a lot of people here, so if we can keep our answers as succinct as possible, so we can keep going through the sources, but go ahead, Sheldon. Shelly, go ahead. Yeah, I think uh, there's a difference between being in the midst physically and being in the midst spiritually. And I think the common thread between the two is that you need to be able to communicate with the other people. The communication, whether it's a verbal communication or a uh, nonverbal communication, that is critical to be in the midst. Okay, so for example, 10 people who are in a similar space, but they are all doing their own things, right? Can, does that mean you are amidst a community? No, I think the communication amongst the people is part of the critical part of being in the midst. Okay. Being able to or actually talking to them? Because uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. Like when, well, I'm, dri when, I'm, driving on, when I'm driving on 95, I am definitely amidst a lot of people, but I wouldn't call right. those people my community, right? When, when you're in shul, in a minion, you're not talking to each other. Ideally. You're talking as a group. So, right, you're, you're talking as a group. So the communication as a group, whether it's actually physically to one another is not the issue. Okay, all right, anyone else? Yeah. Diane, go for it. Yeah, so what I wrote, I don't know if everybody saw it, was having a common goal or focus or intent. Um, and I, I think that that, is more important, um, especially when that intent is to uh, either listen or to, or to um, speak, communicate one way or the other. In other words, it's also the part about listening. It's not just the part about speaking. Ah. That's the communication that has to happen. Okay. So we're going to look at how the rabbis use many of the things you guys are describing, intent and purpose proximity, all of that to ascertain what actually constitutes a minion. So go back to sharing the screen. Uh, okay. So we'll take from the Shulchan Aruch, published in 1565. Uh, Rabbi Yosef Karo wants to codify all of the Sephardic practices in the Jewish community. And so he travels around, he writes down all the things that people are doing to try to create a common sense of practice. Uh, Yosef Karo tries to compile all the Sephardic practices. Comes the Ramah, who's from Krakow, roughly at the same time. And he wants to write down all the Ashkenazi practices. And so they put both of these two things together, and it becomes the Shulchan Aruch as we know it, which really serves as uh, 
arguably the basis of any conversation about normative practices uh, in the Jewish community. It's a real page turner. Uh, I highly recommend it. All right, so we're going to take, uh, it's organized by topic. Uh, this is my version of the text uh, up here. Well, this is the Mishnah Bura, which happens to have it. And just so you can see it, because I think it's fun to take a look, this is my version of the text. I'll go ahead and spotlight it just so you can see what it looks like. Um, this over here is actually the Mishnah Bura, a modern commentary on it. But you have the text published in 1565. Uh, and then the small text, the big text is Yosef Karo. The small text is the Ramah, Moshe Israelis. And then these are just other commentaries about this particular text. And so uh, I, know, I think it's fun to show it. Plus, when you, when you have these books on your shelves, it's fun to show them off. Okay. So here, here are some of the relevant passages. It says, Yesh matirin lomar devar shebikdusha, right? It's, uh, there are those who permit saying uh, a devar shebikdusha, a, a word that requires a minion or a words of sanctification. Shebikdusha bitisha vetsiruf katan, shuhu yotermi ben sheish, veodela mimit palalin, right? Uh, so it says it is permissible to, uh, there are those who say that if you want to make a minion, here, the, the, the beginning place is you need 10 adults. 10 adults is what makes a minion. But then they says, look, there are those people who actually say if you have nine people and a little kid, right, and, you, and he knows why you're praying and how to pray and things like that, in certain situations, that's, uh, that's okay, right? But he goes on to say, let me, right? Uh, but to be honest, there are people who do that practice, but the majority of the major commentators, they actually don't like this practice. They say, you know what, like I know in some shuls, this is the equivalent of they use the Torah scroll as the 10th person, or they give a humash to a little kid, and that counts as the 10th person, right? Comes Moshe Israelis and says, And he says, but listen, there are some people who in the case of an emergency, maybe they don't have a minion, maybe uh, the Jewish community, uh, there are only nine adult Jews who live there. In those kinds of like exigent circumstances, they can give that little kid a sidur or a humash rather, and they count it as a minion. Now, I want to think about the criteria that we've established so far. Number one, all of those people are in the same place. They are all there with the same intention, and they are all still talking to each other, correct? So there's a similarity of, of uh, kavana, of focus, and they are all physically in the same place, right? We'll skip a few uh, simanim, and it says, this is, uh, we skip a few, and it says, right? Number 13. The next one. Right? It is, it is required that all of the people be in one place. And the Shliach Tzivor has to be with them. Right? So this is, everyone's got to be in the same group. Sorry. Uh, and if someone's standing in the doorway, if someone's standing on the wall, or from the door or from the section on the outside, he doesn't count, right? Like if you were to close the door, it's like he's outside. In other words, you actually have to be inside the room. And they're trying to come up with like a, a defining characteristic, what's inside and what's outside. Now, when we think of our shuls, we think of, you know, a little door and, you know, maybe it's uh, the walls five, six inches thick. But if you're existing, you know, a couple hundred years ago, a couple of, or even a thousand years ago, the wall itself might be like a brick stone wall and it's really thick. And so, and the door might be really thin. So are you standing on the inside of it or the outside? One could argue by inserting this halakha, they're making it clear you're not like sort of on the outside. You're actually inside. You have to be in the same space. And so, for example, being in the chapel is different from being in the office right outside the chapel. Being inside the prayer space is different than being in the hallway outside. They're making a distinction between those uh, places, right? 
The next one says, Mi she'omed achorei beit ha'kneset uvnehem chalon, someone who's standing outside of the walls of the synagogue, and there's like a window, there's like a hole, or there's a space where they can actually look inside, right? Afilu gavoha kama komot, even if it's like a really high up window, you can imagine like, I don't know, someone's on stilts, or they scaled the wall. You can just sort of like see them looking on the inside. They're like trying to crawl in, like the squirrels in my office that I could see them trying to get into the boiler room in the shul, right? They're like making the effort to get in there, right? Afilo ena rochev arba umar elahem panav. He shows them their face. He counts as the 10, right? So if you have nine people in the sanctuary and there's someone who's sticking their head and they want to try to be part of it, they can count as the tenth, right? So keep in mind the values we've described. These are all people who want to pray together. These are all people who uh, are doing their best effort, and they are physically in the same space with the intention of coming together to pray, right? And here's like an interesting approach. Um, this is number 15. If some people are inside the room, and some people are outside the room, right? Uh, and the, and the, but if the shliach sibor is in the middle, so the shliach sibor is neither inside nor outside, he can sort of combine them, right? There's like the shliach sibor has this incredible power of like, I see them and I see them, and together I am the one that's combining everybody. That also can count to form a minion. And then finally, here's the last one from the Shulchan Aruch that we're going to look at that I think is relevant for this conversation. Hayu asara b'makom echad. There are 10 people in one space. Ve'omrim kadi shukdusha. So you have a minion, they're praying, and it's fine. Afi milu she'enu imahem yachol anot. If there's a minion going on in one place and someone is outside, but he can hear them, he can answer and be part of that service. In other words, if I'm not in the same space and there's already a minion taking place of people who have gathered, then you can participate in that particular minion, right? And the Yeshurim Shetzarich Shaloye Mafsik Tinuf, I'm sorry, Tinuf O Avodat Kochavim, right? And as long as there's not something like if I'm standing in the hallway of the shul, and there's a minion in the chapel, I can participate in that service and say amen and do the Kaddish and all of those things, provided that like, there's not an idol in between me and what's going on in the service. Because presumably if, I, if you only see me in the hallway and there's a big statue of Venus or something, and I'm saying, right? People are going to say, what's that guy doing? He's a little kooky over there, right? But assuming there's nothing bad in between you and the minion, then it's totally fine. And so this gave rise, pun intended, right? To a tshuva, a question that was asked in 2001. Picture it, Sicily, 1948, right? Anyone, Golden Girls? Okay. All right, fine. Back in 2001, everyone is using AOL. Uh, people are using dial-up or DSL is becoming a little more popular. And they ask the question, may one pray over the internet? Can you constitute a minion over the internet? And through email, in chat rooms, only with a real-time audio or video connection, is this permissible, right? If it is not now permissible, is there some foreseeable technological advance that would make it so? And so this is known as something called the Reisner Teshuvah. And this serves as the basis for what we do in our synagogue. In our shul right now, well, not right now, but in our shul, when there is a minion on Shabbat morning services, you can actually call in or log in and watch what's going on. And you can participate in the services. And that's actually what we do right now based on this work. Before I continue, I just want to take a second. Any questions or comments or observations? Nothing in the chat box. I have a question. Who said that? Yeah. Hello. I have a question. Yeah. David Leach here. Yeah. I okay. actually wrote it out, but in the, I'm assuming that uh, it was referring to men. It, does the Hebrew have a gender to it or do we just assume they mean men? 
Uh, stand by. Oh, when they ask, can like a little kid holding a chumash count? Yeah, they say, te- you, you, your English says 10. It doesn't say 10 men, 10 women, 10 anybody. But I'm assuming historically they were talking about men. But is it is it in the Hebrew or how do we know that? So let me go back for a second. I'll just look at it again. Uh... The katan, uh, specifically a, a, a boy. Right, and they don't say like a katan or a katana, right? Like they, uh, they mean specifically a boy. Uh, so, so with that being the case, at what point did the conservative movement uh, decide that it meant men or women? So that's like a much bigger conversation about egalitarianism, and there's like a there's a there are lots All of right. ways I, there are lots of I ways for how back. we get there. I take yeah. it back. But we can look I at take it back. But we can look at it another day, like to see how we get there. Um, All right. But sometimes so the answer is in that particular context, it's a boy, um, and we can look at egalitarianism or how we did made it more, the world more egalitarian through using a lot of different tools. All right, Diane, go ahead. Okay, um, the, ex- exa- the question you, you, or the example you gave was uh, on Shabbat morning people can call in. Yes. And be part of the, a- and listen to the service. That's the way we do it now. Yeah. Um, I, w- I'm, I-, I think that that's combining two different issues. Sure. Um, because if you had said on a Tuesday, I would say that that's one issue. Can they call in? Is there a minion? Can they say Kaddish with that minion? That's item A. But once you made it Shabbat morning, then you've got to go deal with the can you call in on Shabbat? And that to me is convo- con- confusing the question of the minion because I, I think that they're really two very separate questions. So it's very interesting because, Re- thank you, Diane. Reisner, you'll, we'll look in the tshuva in a moment. The halachic challenges of doing this on Shabbat are very different than the halachic challenges of doing it on a weekday. Uh, you're, you are spot on, and we're going to look at a little bit about, uh, look at some of those things. Any other comments about this? The details, looking at all these things, right? You'll notice every single facet that they've, uh, yeah, Shelly, go ahead. Hold on, if you can unmute yourself. Okay, there we go. Mm-hmm. Um, it didn't answer the question in my mind, whether it's Shabbat or, or daily, it doesn't matter. Can you call in to be the 10th person? So all your, your, your statements already assumed that there was a mini going on. You are asking the million now, dollar question. Sorry. <laughs> no, sorry, go, go ahead. No, but, but your statement uh, assumed there was already a meeting going on in most of the commentary that we talked about saying uh, that the leader, you know, combines people, et cetera, because he can see them. And, uh, but it doesn't beg that part of the question. Correct. You are asking the million dollar question, which is why all of us are here tonight, right? Uh, can- And you're here is, to answer. Yeah. Well, I don't know about it. I'm giving provide an answer. I don't know if I have to provide the <laughs> answer, right? So this is- Okay, so let's, let's bring this up. We'll go big. So this is the Reisner Tshuva, and it basically says the following thing. He says, a minion may not be constituted over the internet. And mind you, he is publishing this in 2001. The internet was very different from what we have now. Some of you were using Juno or Prodigy, Netscape. I mean, things that are now with the dinosaurs, right? So a minion may not be constituted over the internet. Northern can an audio or video conference or any other medium of long distance communication. Only physical proximity as defined, that is being in the same room with the shliach sibor, allows a quorum to be constituted. Full stop, sof pasuk, as we like to say, or I like to say, I don't know if other people say it that way, right? And that's it. He says, look, if you, having said that, right, number two, once a quorum has been constituted, Anyone hearing the prayers being offered in that minion may may respond and fulfill his or her obligations, thereby even over long-distance communications of whatever sort. 
So period, if you have a minion, you can have as many people calling in as you want and, and they can answer. Um, in one of the presentations they've made about online minyanim, uh, people were saying stories of, you know, if I want to say Kaddish for relative, I could call the 8 a.m., I could call the 7 a.m. minion at a manual. Then I can call the 9 a.m., the 8 a.m. minion at a manual in Newton. Then I can go over one area code over to, to Texas and I can join a minion and I can say Kaddish the entire day, right? I can keep saying Kaddishes uh, because I'm always, I'm joining all of these different minyanim, right? He goes on, uh, so that, that's sort of the takeaway right, from the Reisner Tshuva, and that's how everything was since 2001. And, he, so that, right? and then what happens, which by the way is already a, a, a leap, right, I want to point this out, already this is a shift in what does it mean to be part of a minion, because everything up until this point has been, if you want to say the prayers, you want to say Kaddish, you have to go to shul, right, so many of us talk about the purpose of going to minion, the reason why we make a minion is so that the other people can say Kaddish. And now what we're saying is it's not incumbent upon everybody to go to shul. It's incumbent upon just 10 people to go to shul. And then the other people can just call in, right? And then they can fulfill their desire to recite Kaddish just via uh, the phone or some other, uh, some other option. So that's what it was for about 18, 19 years or so. And then we have the situation that we find ourselves in now. Technology has changed. Things are different. And so now they craft, uh, chat sound pretty progressive. Seems pretty progressive for the period. Yeah, even uh, John's, John says seems pretty progressive for the period. Correct. I mean, imagine if uh, some people said, you know, you don't have to really go to shul, you can just call in, right? Think of how different the experience is for people who, uh, after a, a parent passes away, they are spending every morning going to shul or the afternoon going to shul to say Kaddish. You rearrange your entire schedule to uh, be able to say Kaddish. And I'm sure, just from my own show of hands, have, I, have any of you had to recite Kaddish for a loved one and gone to different shuls, either when you're on vacation or as you're traveling? Just by show of hands, if you don't mind raising your hands, right? I would say more, half, right? It's a pretty powerful experience, I think, going, traveling, and having to make minion. And uh, I've had friends who have told me stories where they wrote down all the different synagogues they went to. And some people, whether they travel for work, that all of a sudden they've been to 20, 25 different shuls because they want to find a shul every day. And think of how the idea of being able to call your home shul and say Kaddish there in some ways undoes that entire experience. Because no matter where you travel, as long as you're in the same time zone, I can always call my shul and just say Kaddish over the phone. Right, so uh, John, when you say that's pretty progressive, I think you're right. You're basically removing like one of the defining characteristics that we saw in the Shulchan Aruch of being in the same space. It, it took that out, right? While simultaneously preserving the intact minion, it also gave you some flexibility to go a little further away. So you're right, thank you for po point, pointing that out. Well, all right, let's go here. So then back in March, which, uh, in COVID times feels like 20 years ago, <laughs> right? The CJLS wrote this, and I'm going to read it because uh, some people are calling in over the phone, right? This is what they wrote. The CJLS approved position of Rabbi Avram Reisner, and just to be clear, the CJLS is the Committee of Jewish Law and Standards of the Conservative Movement, who they are the ones who decide what, are the, uh, what is the spectrum of practice that is considered to be within the scope of our movement. The CJLS approved position of Rabbi Avram Reisner that permits remote participants to join on weekdays through electronic means to a minion, 10 adult Jews. David Leach, you'll see there, it doesn't say 10 men, and they actually just specify 10 adult Jews, right? Gathering in person remains the standard practice. The majority of us on the CJLS firmly believe that this should remain the rule even in this Sha'at HaDechak, even in this crisis situation, even in these extreme situations, we still maintain you should have 10 people gathered for a minion and you can call in and participate in that. We all, uh, the majority of us feel comfortable with that uh, place. They go on. However, a number of the members of the CJLS believe that in the current dire circumstances, a more lenient position on constituting a minion remotely may be acceptable, especially since there have been, since there has been significant advances in technology. The classic sources, Shulchan Aruch or Chaim 5513, and others cited by Rabbi Reisner, 
require that a minion be located in one physical space. I just want to point out for a moment that now when the text says, you know, as you know, as it says in Shulchan Aruch 5513, all of you can say, ah, oh, I've read that already. I know that one, right? So now you're getting the primary sources, right? It says that they all must be gathered in one physical place. However, Shulchan Aruch or Achaim 5514, which we also looked at, does open the possibility that there may be an exception by joining in to constitute a minion if one can see the faces of the other participants, right? This was that one that we read, which is one who is standing outside of the synagogue and there's a window, right? Even if it's high up or it looks weird, or, right? And they can see their face, you can form a minion of 10, right? And because of that, right? And because of that, because it says they can see each other's faces, some on the CJLS feel, okay, well, right now I can see your face. Shelly, Evie, Bob, David, I, I see your faces, right? Now here's where, uh, here is where you, people make choices, right? Is it true? Are we fulfilling the requirement of seeing each other's faces right now? Give me a, a thumbs up if I am seeing your face right now, right? Are we in the same place? Is this, and I want you to, like, this is a conversation. I'm not, it's not like a gotcha and it's not a, right? These are like halachic, uh, for people who are not accustomed to having conversations of halacha and different values, this is like entering a new territory, right? But one that we should all be in and in some ways is like all about who we are as Jews, right? It's the same way if you're on Facebook, you know, two months ago, everybody was an expert on uh, judicial law or the Supreme Court. One month ago, everybody was an expert in how you prevent pandemics. And now everyone's an expert in how you open up institutions in response to a pandemic. But Jewish law, we can all give more opinions on this because this is ours, right? Rabbi, some rabbis saw that text, which says, I am seeing your face, right? And so that should count as a minion. And, and in one sense, I, they're right. I see all of your faces right now. But in another way, I'm not seeing your faces. What am I actually looking at right now? A bunch of pixels on a computer screen, right? And I think this is, uh, I see where uh, Josh Heller, Rabbi Josh Heller, who's, who's the one who I think helped write this, right? I see where he's coming from and the desire to want to do it and why it might make sense. But I also see where the text is coming from, right? Uh, I wonder the text, would we, would, would we be having this conversation if the text said, right? If you can see their actual face, versus if the Shulchan Aruch had said, if you can see something that looks like their face, right? Those are two very different descriptions, right? Like, am I seeing you or am I seeing a representation of you, right? And that's a very close reading of the text, right? May combine to form a minion of 10. So it continues, the possibility of a minion being constituted by people who are not physically near each other is further expanded by Rabbi Yitzchak Silverstein, uh, who's a modern, modern Orthodox religious Zionist rabbi uh, in one of his books, and it's one of his commentaries on the Talmud, where he permits constituting a minion for reciting the mourner's Kaddish, where people are scattered in a field but can still see each other, right? So I will tell you that um, this is actually very helpful. There are some situations where we are officiating at a funeral, and perhaps the family, the person who passed away was not well connected or outlived many of their friends or siblings. And despite putting out a, a, an announcement, there are six people at the funeral. So do you recite Mourner's Kaddish there? And so what many rabbis permit is they'll say something like, oh, I think I see a guy. There must be three people visiting someone over there. Oh, there's the, uh, the, the manager of the cemetery. There's the person from Sugarman. There's the, oh, and there's someone crossing the street. Ah, I think um, there's, there are 10 people here, right? And even if we're not, to be clear, remember our original definition, are all 10 of those people there for the funeral? No. Are all 10 of those people there because they want to focus on that person who's getting buried? No. Eh, like there, I see you. I see there's actually 10 neshamas walking around the cemetery. So we'll call, we'll, we'll say Kaddish, right? It counts in that capacity. You'll notice Zilberstein, Zilberstein is saying it's not for a full minion, it's just for Kaddish Atom. Uh, recently, Rabbi Chaim Ovadia called attention to the source 
arguing in favor of constituting a minion by means of real-time video and audio connection uh, between 10 Jews. Uh, to be clear, he does not mean 10 men or women, right? And so there are a couple of people who are willing to expand the scope, right? Others hold that it is permitted to constitute a minion exclusively online for the sake of reciting the Kaddish, right? The source that we looked at earlier sets a precedent that you don't need to have 10 specific people with the same intention in the same physical area to say mourner's Kaddish, right? Maybe the Kaddish has a different kind of uh, valence to it that requires a minion. It's also not mentioned in the Devarim Shebik Dushah in Mishnah Megillah, which we all looked at a little bit ago. And so because of that, and it's not mentioned uh, in the Talmud, right? And so because of that, maybe the mourner's Kaddish sort of exists in a different world than reciting Barhu and having a repetition of the Amidah and reading the Torah the way that we read it during uh, when there is a minion, right? And so there's a couple, right? and so, uh, yes, right? Uh, he says that those who would permit constituting a minion online, whether for all prayers or just the mourner's Kaddish, limit this permission to this specific moment, this Shat HaDachach, when it's forbidden or unsafe for 10 adult Jews to gather in person for weeks at a time. This permission is also limited to an area where most of the congregations have been ordered or recommended to close. And this does not apply to those in an area where the civil and or medical authorities have not recommended or ordered that houses of worship close for public gatherings. So to be clear, this understanding of what constitutes a minion is specific to right now and only in places where we can't gather. Importantly, this is to Diane's point, importantly, this permission to constitute a minion is still subject to concern as to how this might be accomplished on Shabbat. These complicated issues should not be ignored and congregations can bypass these challenges by offering a live streaming option at a time that is not Shabbat or Yom Tov. For example, Friday night before sundown, maybe they can call it the Kabbalat, the interactive Kabbalat Shabbat spectacular. That would be a great name to call it, perhaps. We could call it lunch with Bob. I don't know. We could call it all kinds of things, right? Uh, or, or having something on Friday nights, on Saturday nights, when we make um, Havdalah. And so that's the guidance from the movement. Let me stop sharing for a second. That's the guidance from the movement in terms of how they were able to find a little verse or like one close reading of a text and take it into a different direction to sort of anchor their idea. Uh, on the same token, they could have very easily said something like, this is a really difficult situation and people are really sad. So in this moment, we're going to out of pikuach uh, nefesh because we're worried people, this is bad for their health. We're going to say we can now form a minion in this way. But they want to try to anchor it in, 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 in some foundational rabbinic halachic text and then use it as a launching pad. Any reactions to this text? Any comments, observations, things that resonate with you, challenges? And if we can all remember to keep our answers somewhat succinct uh, so that people, we can, have, we can take lots of questions. And I have more slides, don't worry. Richard, if you could unmute yourself, you'll get the first word. I don't understand why it has to be limited to an absolute crisis. And a medical authority says you close the temple. It's much too limited. They could say it could be open. However, it may not safe to be open for 50 people to go or 40 people to go or something else. It's much too limited. Once you crack the door, Rabbi, they've opened this thing up to a little bit more than an absolute crisis. That's so you're, my view. So you're saying that um, in this moment, you're saying like the, the authors of this text are saying this is a time limited experience, but like once you've opened this option, it's going to be hard to go back. Yeah. Okay, other comments? Exactly right. Once they've opened the door... No, no, Richard, go ahead. Go, Richard, I cut you off. Go ahead. No, I, I mean, once... You, they, they can't... If this is going to be a rabbinic a pronouncement, a rabbinic something or other, you can't say, oh, because the doctor said you have to close the show, it works, but otherwise it doesn't. Come on, Rabbi, that doesn't make any sense. That, that's, that's, that's or, it, or, it done, or it does, or it does. All right, fine, I'll let you go. All right, let's see. Bob, go ahead. Oh, sorry, Bob, go ahead. I just want to agree with Richard. Um, you open the door, there's, there will be a lot more questions. Um, what's wrong with the blizzard when the blizzard comes? 
uh, and uh, the monsoons come. Uh, so you get it. Uh, I don't want to, but I, I don't know why it's so limiting, I, I guess, and why, what are the reasons behind limiting it just because of the emergency? I, I find that a little hard to understand other than they fear losing control. So I think one of the options is, had it not been for COVID, right, no one would be having this conversation, right? Had, had there been, so I think had there not been a, the way they've dealt with it is by saying, if there's a minion of people who want to go, because so much of our tradition is being together in person and all of those things. And if, for example, you find yourself in a situation where you yourself can't go, you can always call in and participate in that way without redefining what it means to actually have a minion. That's how they've resolved uh, this particular case. In terms of using this term, the Shat HaDachach, it's a rabbinic tool that we have, we, I mean, who am I, right? It's a, it's a rabbinic tool that in terms of crisis, you can use that to alleviate some pressure. And so, for example, um, you have this ideal way of how you want to conduct business, and then there's also like a, an alternative way of doing it that isn't considered to be a break from the practice, but it is like a, a different manifestation of that practice. Uh, and that's how they're able to sort of find a little more wiggle room in situations that aren't uh, typical. Uh, Robert Landau asks, what is the intellectual distinction between permitting a virtual minion for Kaddish, but not Barhu or other parts of the service? Um, uh, Bob, that is an excellent question. And I am pleased to let you know that tomorrow night, Cantor Mayer will be leading a whole class about why Mourner's Kaddish is different than other parts of the service and how, um, and, and you should tune in. Um, without taking too much jelly out of the donut, I will say that uh, as it's mentioned in, in the Chuva, it's not, uh, Mourner's Kaddish is not included in the list of things you can't do in the Mishnah. And also the Mourner's Kaddish itself does not, it does not mention God's name. And so because of those, those rubrics, it, has, it is able to enter into a more like amorphous uh, type of place in a situation like right now. All right. Any other comments, observations? Sarul, are you raising your hand? Yes. Go for it. it was just, I've always gone for years when I knew that we had to have This is going way back. I would go on a Wednesday and a Sunday every morning. Rain, shine, snow, as long as the doors were open. Or if they needed me another day, I could be, I would run up and so that somebody could say Kaddish. I thought that the person saying it doesn't feel well anyway. But not to be able to say it adds another shtech into the, into the womb. So I would go. My Phyllis and I were going all the time. So, and they would call me out. I would run up and make it. I felt it was an obligation to that person that they could have the comfort of being able to say Kaddish. That's my personal feeling. And Everybody so is different. I mean, I'm from the old school. I can't help it. I don't know anything different. So what you're describing... I think it's... Yeah, that I was brought up this way. <laughs> I guess I'll grow it as long as I can. Right now, I can't make it in because I can't stand. But I still would do what I would do with over the phone. I don't care. I believe you help a person in distress, especially. Saying Kaddish is not a wonderful thing to have to do. So you help them out, make them feel a little better. Okay. And I'll leave it at that. That's Thank you. Oh, sorry. Yeah, and so uh, there are lots of questions coming in about the difference between Mourner's Kaddish and, um, and other parts of the service. Again, Kent Ramirez is going to talk about it tomorrow. Suffice to say that, you know, it's interesting. Everyone says you get together so that other people can say Kaddish. But that's the language that we use about minion. We don't say we form a minion so we can praise God differently. We form a minion because the musicality of the service sounds better when there's more people, Right. Uh, in many minyanim, and this is generational, I think, so much of going to shul is about, is about saying Kaddish and Kaddish alone. Um, and uh, Rabbi Benny Lau speaks of the, there's the, there's the legal part of, of a religion, of Judaism, 
And there's also the fabric part that he calls it. It's like the warm blanket part of Judaism, the thing that's comforting and the thing that's helpful. But think about, uh, and Mourner's Kaddish for many people fulfills that role. And it is undeniable that for many people, that's what Minyan is all about. And, and that is significant. And I think, um, I think it's why some rabbis are trying to find a wiggle room with Kaddish, trying to understand those needs that people have and that emotional attachment to that liturgical piece, while also trying to maintain the standard definition of what it means to have a minion, right? Uh, and maybe we're trying to have our cake and eat it too, right? So, uh, and sometimes it's okay to eat cake. I love cake. All right, let's keep going and looking at, looking at this text, and then we'll look at more questions. So here's where I am, and I, wanna, I think I have uh, a lot of similar ideas that you do, uh, and then we'll, here's the meta concerns. Um, number one, I don't want this period to feel normal, right? These are not normal times. This is not typical. This is not how we typically do things. And I don't want to make this how we normally work. And so for me, the absence of a minion reminds me of what's going on in the world right now. And so I think about how prayer is meant, ideally, to reflect what's going on in the world. And so this year, Rosh Hashanah, I believe, is, starts Friday night and is on Saturday. And so we're not blowing shofar on the first day. And so for many of us, blowing shofar, not blowing shofar on Rosh Hashanah is like the defining quality of having Rosh Hashanah fall on Shabbat. And all of us can say we miss hearing the shofar. It's, it causes all of this sentimental memory. But that's just part of having Rosh Hashanah on Shabbat, right? Number two, half halal on Rosh Chodesh. The rabbis, uh, instead of reciting the full halal like we do on holidays, on Rosh Chodesh, we recite half of it. The idea is sometimes people have to go to work. They have things to do. We don't make seven aliyot. We, it's longer to mark that it's different, but it doesn't feel like a regular holiday. And we include Avinu Malkenu during fast days and the 10 days of repentance. We don't, have, uh, we don't recite Tachanun if there's a bride or a groom in the minyan or if there's a baby having a brit milah. In other words, we allow what's happening in the world around us to influence what we do as part of our prayer practice. And so in a moment like this, where we can't open our doors, right, and we can't gather safely, um, there is something for me at, that changes the dynamic of what it means to have a minion, right, or, or to pray typically in these situations. Um, number two, which is something a lot of you brought up, is when does the shahat, the shahat dachak end, right? Does this period of crisis end when the government says we can open? Is it when doctors say we can open? Is it when we get a vaccine? Is it when people start getting the vaccine? Is it when we've decided that it's effective? And then the, the meta question or a meta question is what happens if at risk, at risk group don't feel comfortable coming back? Do we have individualized exemptions? Do we have a different standard? If you're in your 80s, you can call in and you count in the minion. But if you're under 80, you have to actually come and be present. And then I'm concerned. I personally, the clergy also, were concerned. What happens if there's nine people in the room and one person's online. Do we say, great, that person, we, now we have a minion, right? And so for the nine people who schlepped out and the one person who called in, what do you do in that situation? I think it becomes very messy and it becomes very complicated, right? Um, and the other pieces I'm worried about long-term, how do we ensure that there will be an in-person minion in the future, right? Um, I, am, I am eager to get back into the building when we can do so safely and we can do so uh, in a way where we've minimized risks and we've done it in a thoughtful way. And we can honestly say, how, did we, were we thoughtful enough in how we've implemented this procedure? Um, and also recognize that we want to get back because the normal is that we have minion um, in person. And so, so far we've seen two different approaches. One approach, uh, I'm calling it option one, is we say, uh, there's nothing wrong with praying by yourself, right? Private tefillah is something that we've done for a pretty long time, Right. And the rabbis make a, a point to say, um, you can always pray by yourself. And when you pray by yourself, you pray differently than when you're in a minion. And uh, mo all Orthodox uh, and many, maybe even most conservative synagogues have canceled minion and they've encouraged personal prayer or encouraged uh, a minion without uh, reciting a Devarim Shabik That's what, uh, uh, and that includes um, saying the Baruch Hu, saying the repetition of the Amidah, and public Torah reading. Um, that's been option one. And the strengths of that approach are that you don't change the definition of minion, 
and you're not, you don't have to rely on new interpretations, and it recognizes the time and space. The drawbacks are that not everyone has the fluency or the comfort level to pray regularly. Um, not saying Kaddish in a time when people have experienced a loss is really hard and adds insult to injury, as Srul said. Um, and for many people, they've been praying their whole life as part of the minion, and so it makes their lives even more disrupted. Option two is to redefine what constitutes a minion, and then you maintain the ritual and liturgical flow of the year. You celebrate the holidays the same way, you have a Zoom Seder, you have your services online, and you limit the impact of COVID on your personal prayer life, right? And so what we've done uh, in the synagogue, what we've done at, Emma, at, Emma, at Emmanuel starting in the middle of March, and then we've updated last week, was how do we accomplish all the goals of Minion during this time, right? Which these are all the things that we listed over here, right? How do we create a sense of community? How do we allow people to focus on one thing? Um, how do we create a sense of being together with other people as opposed to being by yourself? Um, how do we enable people to have a, say, either say Kaddish or have a moment to honor their loved ones? Um, how, do we bring people, we, how do we bring people closer? Um, how do we create community in a time where, frankly, we can't be part of the community? And how do we create a space where everyone can participate equally? And our initial attempt to do that was with the Zman Kodesh. And then with feedback, it evolved over time, uh, had a big shift last week, but it changed over time. Um, where we started with Pesuket, we included, um, sorry, Birchot HaShachar, uh, instead of Pesuket, uh, Birchot HaShachar, we did some Torah study so people can interact with each other and talk and share. We recited the prayer for those who are ill in the community and then created a space, originally the prayer in lieu of Mourner's Kaddish, and then based on feedback from the congregation, changed it so that we could recite the actual Mourner's Kaddish. Um, we've emphasized the non-Shabbat parts of us coming together as a community, and so, there's evening learning and lunch sessions, as well as our morning and afternoons Zman Kodesh. We've, made, we've emphasized Kabbalat Shabbat, and whereas before on an average Shabbat you would get maybe 15 households, now we're getting 50, 60, up to 70 households coming together to bring in Shabbat together, and then something sometimes between 20 and 30 households at the end of Shabbat for Havdalah, and we're creating community in that approach as well. And again, based on the feedback, we're offering classes moving forward on Monday nights, Tuesday nights, and Wednesday nights. And we're working on creating more social programming as well, right? And so we're accomplishing, I think, all of the goals of our original part of Minion, right? And the, 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 the next piece of this uh, is what's our goal moving forward, right? How do we return to in-person Minyanim so we can then stream services? to go back to a sense of normalcy and, re, and really build on the uh, principle, the tshuva of Rabbi Avram Reisner, right? And that might be forming six groups of 12 or maybe seven groups of 12. You invite 10 of them to come to Minyan, probably evening Minyan, so you can get a Mincha and a Mari in there. And then you establish protocols and guidelines for health and safety. People have to wait in their cars and then everyone parks up by uh, Morris and we open the doors to the sanctuary and two people sit in the balcony, six people sit on the floor, and two people sit on the bima. And we stream those services. We invite people to bring their own sidurim and wear masks. And then everybody goes and leaves. And that's how we have minion. And that's how people can participate in services. But I think in this moment, um, and, and eventually we create a sense of, of normalcy, but what, what used to be. Um, I think there are lots of important questions we have to ask ourselves in this moment. That is, number one, what have we learned from the Zman Kodesh experience, right? How does smart start time affect Minyan attendance? 7 a.m., which was when we normally have Minyan, to 8 a.m., I think has made a difference for a lot of people. Does 5.45 work for most people, or does a later Minyan time, if you're meeting in person, does that resonate with them? Um, we've also seen the power of how informal learning augments Minyan attendance. We've received overwhelming responses uh, in the survey that people liked learning. They liked having 10 minutes to exchange ideas, to talk, to be challenged, to understand what's going on as part of the service. We also learned that some people really like Minion. They like going and they like that experience. Um, but for many people going and reciting the liturgy, that they don't know what it means, it doesn't resonate with them, and they can't pray in the Hebrew, can be alienating. And that's why they don't go to Minion or they only come to say Kaddish. And I think we've also seen that our Minion is made of maybe 
10 to maybe 20 people who are minion regulars who come a few times a week or several times a week. Um, but in a congregation of 775 households, our daily minion is not part of their uh, daily shul experience. And so I think this is one of those moments where we have to reevaluate how do we as a congregation sustain a twice daily minion, recognizing that uh, its current status does not appeal to uh, swaths of our congregation. And I think those are big questions that we have to be asking ourselves as we return back uh, into the sanctuary, God willing, uh, in a month, in six weeks, uh, at some time um, like that. Uh, I'm trying to, uh, so that's it. Questions, that's where we are. Uh, questions, comments. Uh, also, I'll say one more thing. Uh, based on the feedback, by the way, it's also uh, Yisker on the Thursday night of uh, Shavuot before Yom Tov starts. We got a lot of feedback that people want to recite Yisker, but they don't want to use technology on Yom Tov. And so we're moving Yisker services earlier. So it's time uh, in addition to having it in its regular slot. And so it's a real challenge of figuring out um, what parts of the tradition do you tweak in the situation and what do you allow the way it used to be so you can go back to it uh, when it's there. Um, and, and that's my presentation. Let's take some comments, some observations. I'm gonna quickly look at the chat box uh, and then I'm gonna field some comments. So give me just 30 seconds to look at what people wrote and then I'll come back. Uh, uh, what, well, what if you feel it's important to add to the 10? So, so we'll take the minion from the Okay. Okay. And, uh, is it the time? What if I. Okay, great. So I looked at all those comments and I'll, I'll, I'll try to pepper them in through my answers. Questions or comments, and I'll remind you if we can all keep our answers somewhat succinct so, we, so lots of people can give their opinions. Uh, raise your hand if you'd like to say something. Yeah, Max and Avram, go for it. Okay, um, we're we're in the age group that that we're over eighty, and, and we have at least one of us has health issues. So the idea of physically going back into the temple uh, is not something I would do in the foreseeable future. Where does that leave us? where we still want to remain connected and we wake up every morning and we Zoom. And then at 5.45, we Zoom and we both feel very connected. Where, what happens then? So I think this is, so first of all, thank you for being so honest and open about your specific situation. Uh, Shayna said something to me very interesting uh, before during dinner tonight. She said, any organization that isn't asking themselves, what have we learned through this process? What is better during this process? And what is worse? And what can we carry with us moving forward? Uh, isn't, if they're not asking these kinds of questions, then they're going to fail because this has been a huge learning experience for all of us. So here's what I will say. One of the things we've learned is that lots of people want to be connected and for a variety of reasons can't come to shul right? Uh, people with special needs and people with health, situa uh, health complications before COVID hit have been raising the issue, Max, that you are raising right now for years, right? For years, they've been saying, like, like you know, I can't come to shul, I have mobility issues, or I'm immunocompromised. And lots of people said, well, you know, what can you do, right? And now all of a sudden, because we're all affected by it, we all care about it in a much more significant way. Yeah. And so I think this is why the, the first piece is that um, whatever we do moving forward, whether it's our educational course offerings, whether it's Minion, whether it's uh, our arts program, like you name it, I think there's going to have to be a, a streamed part of it, right? Or a streamed component, which is to say, um, we've already wired the shul and, and, and improved our capacity. So when we, wherever we are, whether we're in the vestry or the chapel, or the meeting house, you name it, we can now stream live from there. And so a comforting thing to know is that God willing, when we can have in-person minion again, that all of those services will still be streamed, right? And- by Okay, I don't wanna interrupt you. By streaming, does that mean Zoom? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so 
does right. does that okay. does, does Zoom feel qualitatively different to you? Yeah, Zoom I can get. Facebook Live I can't. Ah, so the other piece that you're asking, Max, is one of the benefits of Zoom is we can all see each other, right? Yeah. Uh, one of the benefits of live streaming or a benefit or how it works is you only see what's happening in the chapel, right? And so a question we're going to have to ask ourselves is uh, whatever technology we use, uh, do we use Zoom where one camera is the entire sanctuary, right? Mm -hmm. And the entire boxes are filled by all the participants who are seeing each other. Um, that's a question, right? Are we live streaming our daily minion or are we Zooming our daily minion? Uh, because that changes the overall experience, but it also means whoever's in the sanctuary doesn't get to see everybody else, right? In other words, if you want to have this experience of seeing everyone, then you stay at home, right? But if you want to see other, right? It sort of changed. Do you get what I'm saying, Max? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm open to either. I think that's a conversation we should explore about which technology do we use moving forward. But I think streaming is going to be a part of it no matter what. Other comments, observations? Yeah, Judy. I think if you're streaming, you still feel as if you're outside. You're, you're, you're seeing things, but you're not, and you're participating by yourself, but you're not really part. And I think if you're in the sanctuary, I don't think it matters if you see everybody else because you see the people who are in the sanctuary. And I also wonder if you couldn't do fit 10 people in the chapel without any problem and still be safe. So we're, we as a staff are meeting with, um, with uh, Dr. Michael Fine uh, on Thursday night to ask some of these very questions um, for us to say, does it make sense? Like, is it, quality, is it qualitatively different being in the meeting house versus the sanctuary versus the chapel versus being in the parking lot with a tent, right? These are all things that we're exploring because I think, you know, there will always be a point where you'll say it's too early, right? You can, it's always easy to say like, oh, we'll just keep doing this, frankly, forever right? Or until for a year, for two years. Um, because the safest answer is we're always going to stay online in our homes by ourselves. And at a certain point, when is that moment where we're willing to, uh, where the cost benefit analysis is saying we're going to go to Minion and we're going to practice all of these uh, safety practices, not just the minimum that we have to do, but like really go above and beyond. And that might mean, for example, Judy, even if the chapel is big enough that you could get away with six feet in between each individual person saying we're going to do it in the sanctuary because we can open all the windows and bring in some fresh air and we cannot forget six feet. You can have six pews in front of you. Right. And so that way it feels uh, we're being even more uh, careful than we need to be. That that's true, but I don't think that will feel as together. I think 10 people in a sanctuary is not going to feel good. Also true. You are right. You are. I, I concede. You're, you are correct. Um, and, and, you know, it's going to be a year before I'm back, you know. I'm not coming back till there's a vaccine, no matter what Michael says. Right. Right. And I don't, I want to be there. If you. Sorry, you broke up, Judy. Can you say it again? Uh, I, and, uh, you know, it's not that I don't want to be there. I am, you know, being over whatever. Um, it's not going to. It's not going to be considered safe. Yeah, and so and and so I I hear you, and I think that's why whatever we do, I think streaming needs to be part of it, and I think zooming is the answer that we put a camera in the same, uh, uh, like a big screen TV in the sanctuary, and so the ten people who are in the minion can see everybody else who is also logging in and part of the minion. Both. Right, and so that feels like you're more of a part of it. Yeah. Oh, Cantor Mayor Hatzadik, yes. Unmute yourself. Go for it. Thanks. Uh, first of all, thank you for such a great presentation on all of the uh, sources that you brought and shared with us. Um, secondly, I am looking forward to continuing this conversation with everyone tomorrow about Mourner's Cottage in particular. But what I wanted to mention about the space issues and social distancing uh, and I'm looking forward to running this by uh, Dr. Fine on Thursday evening when we have our session with him. Um, there was a major announcement made by the um, uh, American Choral Directors Association, the ACDA, uh, came out last week and it really shook the, the singing world in uh, 
in the United States. Um, the research was um, showing them that singing uh, propels the aerosols much further than six feet. And um, they were giving uh, evidence about uh, choirs that continue to rehearse into March and how devastating an effect it has had in terms of um, people being infected in, in one rehearsal. Uh, and what they are recommending is that musicians not get together, singers in particular should not be near each other. And I wanna run this by Dr. Fine on Thursday. How does that translate into 10 Jews being in a chapel, uh, many of whom are singing, uh, do we need to be in a larger space? So I understand the uh, sense of uh, intimacy in the chapel, which is such a gorgeous space, is very appealing, but I'm curious to hear from Dr. Fine his reaction to the ACDA's recommendations. The other thing we are anxiously awaiting is what is, uh, how, how, how far do the uh, particles go when you blow the shofar? Because that's another big question we have to ask, right? Do they, which I sort of say tongue in cheek, a friend posted a photo today of a shofar with a mask on it. Um, and so, but these are, these are big questions, right? How do we do this in a safe way that also allows and recognizes that people want to get together and people want to connect and there's something about community that is powerful, but also that we're doing it in a way that's safe. And, and I think I'll be, we want to wade into this very carefully. As we said, we're not going to be the first uh, institution that opens in Rhode Island, um, period. Yeah, Bob. Just thinking that the, the, it's all new, it's all different, and it will be different. So this is so out of our comfort zones to even try to think what shul will be like. Um, and people that haven't been able to come, won't be able to come. We haven't been able to gather. We're, we're all in this kind of, all this Huxley, Brave New World type of thing. Um, and I think that the Rabbanim are going to have to lead this. And I think that is, in this case, talk about an island with three shoals on it that only have two people. Um, I don't think you'll have a, a, a great understanding of what the risks are. Some people will want to go and other people will just fight it because it's not in their comfort zone. Uh, I understand someone saying they won't come to show until there's a virus um, vaccine. I understand the people that say, I want to go back now. I haven't gotten sick. I'm tired of all this. So I think it will be just a try. Um, and I think that people, as long as the show says, look, if you're doing Zoom now and that's your comfort zone, we will continue to Zoom whatever services we have and live stream on Shabbat. I think that's a great confidence going forward. But as far as when we meet and where we meet, I think it's going to be um, trial and error. And I'm glad I don't sit where you do. Ironically, you only live like a half a mile from here, just to be clear, it's not so far. Other comments or observations? Yeah, Susie, if you could unmute yourself. So I read today that Israel is actually opening tomorrow, and personally, I think they're crazy. The shows will be able to open tomorrow with up to 50 participants. As long as they're two meters apart, there's a corona official, and everyone has to use proper hygiene. But they're not even opening with 10. They're opening with immediately with 50 people. And I know my brother said that he has absolutely no interest in going back to Shoal before he knows that it's 100% safe. And that might take a long time. Yeah, I think this is, and it's why we're, yeah, how do you, how do you open up in a right way? Like, um, it's interesting. We, had a, we were on a phone call with a couple of uh, health officials, and they said, what number would be meaningful to you? And so we said, you know, 10 would be a meaningful number. And or originally they said five. And we're like, ah, five doesn't really help us one way or the other, right? And then we said, well, what about 10? And they said, ah, 10 is better. And, and then some uh, folks in the Orthodox community said, well, like 10 doesn't work for us because it's really not fair to say 10 people can come to Minion 
And of the 10 people who can come to shul, it's going to be the men. So that way they could have the, they could form a minion. And so they asked, could it be in Israel for a while? It was 19 was the original number, I think, because that way it could be 10 men uh, and nine women in their minyanim. And so that's how they tried to find a way to open and be able to bring a sense of normalcy back to life uh, without trying to bring such adverse risks. Look, in some synagogues, uh, it's a little bit easier. If you're in a community that is already by definition a little more suburb, a little more urban, uh, more rural rather, and it, it's a little, everyone's more spread out and it's a small shul with 50 families or 50 households, that's one kind of situation. And if you're our shul with 700 plus households, that's a very different thing, right? Our high holidays um, have over, I don't know, a thousand people, right? 1500 people can be in the building and that's not gonna, that's not gonna work under any circumstances by September. Shelley. Yeah. I think uh, one of the, the, the issues is we are learning every day new things about this COVID-19, what's, what's effective, what's not effective, what vaccines are starting to work, not work, whatever. And I think it will be up to the clergy when you make those decisions as to what we're going to do to be flexible enough to have a plan B and C and be able to move, you know, you know, turn on a dime. Correct. Say, oh, this is not working. Tomorrow we're going to do this. And, and, the, and the community is going to have to understand that because information is changing every single day. And I think one of the, yeah, we have a plan Aleph, a plan Bet, a plan Gimel. And I think each plan, different plans have different strengths, right? So as one, as one example, if someone said you could have a gathering of 50 people, all right, so 50 people, if you have a shul with, uh, 200, with 100 family, 100 households, maybe you could feasibly have a rotation where there's different rooms and different services, and that, that's plan A. But if all of a sudden, instead of 50, it's 25, well, maybe you can't do that anymore. You can't have rotations anymore. And right. what if a synagogue says, um, and different synagogues, there are different approaches. One of them is to say, we're going to have all streaming services. Everything's online. No, and others even, are, even, even more important, is what happens if tomorrow you can say you have 50 and all of a sudden we find, uh oh, we get new information. Wait a minute, you can only have 10 no matter what. Correct, because, or there's an, out, or there's an the outbreak. New information is becoming more dangerous than we thought. Or there's an outbreak, right? Like the week before right. Rosh Hashanah, right? Yeah, these are all the right. things. I want to, you are right. One of the challenges in this movement, to be clear, in the conservative movement, because as a friend once pointed out, uh, the conservative movement is not just a, a style of worship, but it is an approach to Jewish law and Jewish life. And that is, in some ways, it would be easy to simply say, we're just going to make a minion at a, you know, we're just going to have a virtual minion, period. Because, you know, I see you, I hear you, it's good enough, right? And one of the challenges that we have is how do you uh, make that leap continuing in a tradition that goes back 2,000 years, right? And the litmus test or the way they did it in this tshuva is by this whole thing of sticking your face in the window, right? And I get why for some people this works and I get why it's community and I get why people miss, I do, I really get it. Um, the challenge is um, what are the long-term consequences of doing that? And then also what are the long-term consequences of not doing that, right? What are the consequences of not providing a place for people to have a sense of connection or a, play, or a way for people to communicate with each other. That's also presents its, its, its challenges and also its opportunities. Michael, go ahead, if you could unmute yourself. And let's, let's uh, put a clock on 15, 15 more minutes, Max. Michael? Yeah, you go for it. Is that this Michael? Yes, uh, the, one, the one and only. I, 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 I'm kind of concerned that the, the, um, the conservative uh, 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 authorities have not gone further uh, mainly because um, we have is issues of life being at stake, of people um, being separated from the community because of, uh, of life-threatening conditions. Um, it's time to think a little bit um, more liberally about, well, yeah, we should encourage having a minion someplace as a core for the worship, but it should be, should be possible to join in in a fuller way using the technology that we have. And it's not the streaming on Shabbat. Right now, you don't even see a, 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 a minion or you wouldn't see a minion the way it's done. Um, 
it would be through um, fuller participation um, from a distance. Um, and that looking in the window is certainly, I mean, what we're doing right now. I mean, we're looking in a window and uh, we, we, we could be having a service and including everybody. So it sounds like you, you would qualify this as like a minion. Uh, no, not necessarily. I, I didn't go that far, but some might. Uh, unless you've got uh, 10 people running around in your house, I, th I think you only have a few and some of them don't qualify. Certainly. Uh, <laughs> but, but no, no, I think the idea was that you have 10 people in the room and then you can look in the window and you could participate. You could say, Amen. So you're saying you're saying like an enhancement. You're saying like an enhancement of the Reisner Chuva. Yes. So one. So I'll remind everyone. I hear where you're coming from. I, I the a part of this, as I spoke about last Wednesday, is if you're emphasizing one part, right? You have you're also if you're strength if you're machmi or strict on one part, you're makeel perhaps on another. And so I'll ask the question: How would we feel if on Shabbat morning, when you walk into shul, there's a projector, with a big screen? And you see like 30 faces are on it, right? How does that change the experience for the people who are in the room, right? We're creating a greater sense of community, but for so many people, Shabbat is marked by breaking away from technology, right? And so this is there for, and I hope you hear the sensitivity. I hope that I'm projecting of, I hear all everyone's points. And I hope you hear that for every like reason to do it, there's a reason not to. And then for a reason not to, there's also a reason to do. And, I, and, and that's the, this is the conversation of how Jewish law unfolds. Michael, go ahead. No, I'm, I'm, I'm finished. I think oh, okay. I, I was making the point that Jewish law should unfold in a way that's gonna hold the community together and allow people to participate. Beautiful. All right, Diane, go ahead. Oh. I, I'm concerned um, that this will work just fine on weekdays, but it's going to be very difficult on Shabbat and Yom Tov. My dad's yurt site is on the seventh day of Pesach, and I couldn't um, participate in, you know, say, Kaddish for him in any kind of normal part of, of the world. Had it been not on Shabbat or on Yom Tov, then I would be fine doing it with a Zoom minion. I can live with the windows mm -hmm. uh, or looking through the windows. I can't, I can't get comfortable with using electric, electronic connections on Shabbat or Yom Tov. And I don't know that it matters to me whether there are 10 people on, on a screen and 10 people in the sanctuary and 10, unless I'm personally one of those people who's in the sanctuary and I haven't had to uh, violate Shabbat as I define it. I think the Shabbat piece is really hard. I think, you know, for so many people, we, you walk around the building and on Shabbat, we make a big deal about not using technology on Shabbat. Right. And so how do you balance those things? And do you just say, you know what, the times are different and we're going to um, cancel all of that approach. Right. And use technology because we're going to emphasize the part of uh, community and the, the, the idea of togetherness. Or do you make Shabbat feel different and you and you beef up the weekday offerings. Right. This is all. Uh, challenging, right? And this is uh, ultimately one has to make a decision. The and 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 it's good to get feedback from different people, right? The uh, the idea of saying mourners Kaddish is more significant than forming a minion. If there's a way we can say mourners Kaddish, we'd prefer to be able to do that. That will hold us over, right? Then then let's then we can figure out how to do that. Um, I think I'm concerned that the the connection for how we get from. Uh, uh, what a definition of a minion is, right? To counting this as a minion, it for me feels like a, a, a leap, but it also feels like I see how you can make it, but it feels like a leap that I think has long-term consequences that, that I'm worried about. It also sometimes, for some people, no, for me, feels like there are lots of other alternatives that we could do, which are equally, which resonate with people and are also helpful, right? 
And so, um, and so why not focus on all of those things? In other words, if people have trouble connecting on Shabbat because they don't want to use electricity, then let's make options available the other six days of the week, right? If we can't read Torah, we can at least study Torah together, right? If we can't uh, get together physically, then we can chat socially. Um, are there ways of accomplishing all the goals we've described before without having to redefine what it means to be in community, what it means to be in the midst of the congregation? We have about 10 minutes left. Any other uh, comments? John, go for it. All righty. Uh, the issue of um, staying cottage, particularly during Shiva, uh, well, let me rephrase. I, I think to all of us, we have different priorities for when we are staying cottage. Uh, relative to what Diane was uh, sharing, it was 21 years ago that my mother passed away the day before Pesach started. Uh, the funeral and the interment was in Jersey. At the time I belonged to Bethel, I had been raised in a reformed synagogue, and I came back here and there was no way for me to sit um, because Michael Kahana was flexible, and again, it was a reform shul. Uh, we still had to get together at my house on a Saturday evening. We didn't have a formal menu, but again, there was the flexibility in the reform uh, movement to be able to say Kaddish. If I hadn't said that, and if Michael Kahana had not been sensitive to the, to the fact that I really needed closure, I, I would have been left up in the air. And I, I think what each individual or reason for saying Kaddish, uh, whether it be during Shiva or post Shiva, is different for many people. And it, it, I think that needs to be addressed somehow. So I think that's, so first of all, I think you're describing that after, um... If, so, if you do a burial before a, a festival or a holiday, the shiva gets canceled, I think is what you're describing. Correct. Right? And so what, what the concern, what we did at my old shul, I think it's the practice here as well, um, is that you can still have minion in people's homes because there's nothing wrong with having a minion in your mm -hmm. home. Um, as I've said to people, we're all private citizens. You want to have a minion in your house? You go for it. Right? Um, the... And, and so we can, we can get together and we won't call it a Shiva minion because we're maintaining the sense of, uh, of not having Shiva during that period. But when we all go together, we can still offer you our condolences. We can still do, we can still have a minion in your house, right? There are ways, the, the question, it's an approach to Jewish law, right? How do we work it, right? Because one approach is to say like, I don't care that Shiva has been canceled. You're going to mourn on Pesach, right? And another approach is to say that, I know this is what traditionally is done. Here's a, a workaround, right? So that you're still honoring what the law uh, is traditionally understood, but there's wiggle room within it. The question is, how much do we wiggle right now, right? Do we redefine uh, what it means to be a, a minion, which is like a central part of who we are as a people, uh, or do we wait it out a little bit longer in the hopes of getting back to the to the chapel again? But I agree. I think, and I think that's what we've noticed, right? As I think John, you said it was very progressive in 2001 to say you could say Amen and mm -hmm. recite Mourners Kaddish over the phone, right? And in fact, it's interesting, in some communities where they have 10 people in one house, they have actually said, we're going to have minion every single day in our house. There are 10 people in this space, and you can join us in say Kaddish as part of our community, as part of our in-person minion, right? And that way they don't have to redefine what it means to be part of a minion, and you can still attach yourself to that minion. All right, one or two last comments. The night is long, and it's almost time for Kriya Tashma, as they like to say. <laughs> Bob, go for it. Well, just um, uh, thanks for presenting this. I think you don't have a wide enough audience. I hope this was kind of a test um, test call because this is a something I think has to be widely spread and give more people a chance to answer um, why they didn't come. I don't know. But um, I think you also have to think about more leaders in the new scenario. You're talking about seven people, seven teams, of 12 people um, to run Mignonum. You have to get those people and an alternate to be able to lead services. Um, and although I think we have a whole cadre of very um, uh, people that can lead services, um, you need to bring someone like me up to speed where I feel comfortable doing that. 
And I think you'll probably have to do that in conjunction with getting these seven teams together too. Yeah, and it's also, I think, an opportunity to really talk about what does it mean to create a thriving minion culture at the synagogue, right? I think, uh, or to tell our high school kids, you know. That's a big plus. Yeah, to tell our high school kids, you know, we need your help now more than ever before. We need your help to form a minion, and we want this to be part of your regular experience for all of our college kids who are at home to say we would like for you to be part of this and make, you know, it's, a, it's an opportunity for people to really get involved in ways they probably would not have gotten involved uh, a little bit ago. All right, my friends, how lovely to spend a Tuesday night uh, discussing matters of halakha, to learn from the Shulchan Aruch, to, ne- to learn a little bit of Mishnah, to learn a little bit of Talmud together, uh, and see how it impacts us today. Um, this is going to be an ongoing conversation as we figure out how do we as a community accomplish all those goals that we described at the beginning um, and, and still fi- call ourselves part of the conservative movement. How do we still say that we are following part of halakha? Um, and that's the challenge. And now you get to sort of see how, how, the, how the sausage gets made, right? Um, I think, David, you mentioned, right, how do we become egalitarian? Uh, it, it's it's hard. It's complicated. It took a lot of loops and redefinitions of things and re-evaluating things that we hold sacred for a long time till we could get here. Um, and and this is the same piece, right? How do we decide what do we do uh, and, and think about its long-term consequences down the road, right? In 50 years, right, what will the consequence be for counting 10 people online as a minion? And what will it be if the consequences if we don't count 10 people in a minion? These are the things that keep me up at night. That and my kids. But these are mostly, mostly my kids. But this too from time to time. All right, friends. Um, I will say goodnight to all of you. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to email me. I think this is going to go out to the congregation so they can take a look at it as well. Um, and uh, we'll take it. Uh, don't forget tomorrow night, 730 with Cantor Mayer. I'm going to go ahead and, and unmute everyone so we can fill this space uh, with lots of happy voices. And with that, we can all say Lila Tov to each other. Thank you, Lila Tov to everybody. Lila Tov. Good night. Good night, everybody. Thank you, Rabbi. Good night, And everyone for their input. I really we appreciate it. That. We appreciate actually spending this time with us. It's very important. Me as well. Me as well. You better save the chat, Michael. You can't save the chat. I think that'd be useful. Absolutely. Yeah. They, um, when I close this, the chat, everything it gets saved as a TXT file. Yeah. So I'm going to save it. Thank you, Judy. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night, Good night everyone. Good night. Everybody stay well and safe. Amen. Thank Bye-bye. you. Oh, that was, what do you think?